like to say I'm welcome to uh, the Seattle Central Public Library Gates Auditorium. It's great to see so many people here and uh, this, this demonstration of interest in our city's fine and colorful history and, and uh, to hear a wonderful, uh, knowledgeable uh, speaker tonight who uh, I think is just going to be enchanting. I'm Peter Steinbrook and I'm on the Seattle City Council. I chair the Urban Development and Planning Committee and I'm co-chairing our council's Committee of the Whole Waterfront uh, process. Uh, council Member Richard Conlon is dealing with the, largely with the transportation issues on the central waterfront. As you know, there's talk of a, a huge uh, tunnel and uh, taking down the viaduct and replacing the seawall, massive reconstruction, which was part the impetus for this event tonight and the work that the council has sponsored as part of this. My part on the, um, in terms of our committee review is that I chair the, uh, the second half of that committee, which is to look at uh, the development standards that uh, may occur in the future, the planning for a reconstructed waterfront, issues ranging from the near shore habitat to what kind of pedestrian environment we're going to have there, what the street will look like and how the, the seawall might be replaced with something more habitat friendly, but also historic preservation and uh, recalling um, in every way we can through any reconstructive approaches uh, our city's wonderful and, and unique path. So that's what tonight is about. Um, the waterfront, our central waterfront is in transition and we have, we're, we're standing in the face of some major redevelopment plans. In fact, some of the biggest public works plans ever to be proposed uh, in, in total in excess of $4 billion if the tunnel project goes ahead uh, along with the replacement of the seawall which is basically just a vertical wall that uh, uh, supports uh, all of the fill and development on the on the landed side. So what uh, the council would like to to do with this effort, we commissioned Paul Dorpat last December uh, to pull the research together that he has been involved with over many years, also to look at our city's archives. We have a tremendous collection of, of photographic history of the central waterfront and other parts of the city and also to borrow from the Museum of History and Industries archives as well and retell the story of the city central waterfront from the earliest beginnings that we have um, recorded uh, information on uh, to the present and help us rediscover what is unique and authentic about Seattle's central waterfront. And as we look to the future, we should be informed by our colorful past and in fact, the history of the central waterfront it's wor it, it's as a working waterfront is really integral to the history of Seattle from the first settlers in 1852 to the present, all the changes and the periods of transition. Paul is gonna uh, helpfully inform us on, on those various episodes in the uh, continuous history of the waterfront. But also, as we embark on these major redevelopment plans, what is there worth preserving? What is truly authentic? Um, it's not clear to everyone, and it may be um, that you need to know a little bit more about the waterfront to identify what is truly authentic, because you may just see um, some of the things that might appear to be latter-day um, activities relating to tourism, uh, coffee shops, cafes, uh, and uh, souvenirs, t-shirts, and so forth, but there's really much more there that is still of value. So the other goal here is to hope, hopefully is to help educate the public and the decision makers, the policy makers, myself included, so that we have a greater appreciation for what we have, what's unique to Seattle, what is authentic, and be better informed as we plan uh, for those major changes in the future. I'd like to just throw out a few did you knows um, to give you some idea of what um, we may be hearing about tonight. For example, uh, the peers were not always numbered. Why were they numbered and when? And I'm not gonna answer these questions for you. <laughs> also, uh, you may have taken note that the piers do not extend at a perpendicular relationship to the shoreline. They extend angularly from the shoreline. Why is that? And what, what is the oldest pier on the central waterfront today? What is the longest pier? And what has it been used for over in the, in the past? Where is the buried ship? Does anybody know that one? 
There is a hull of a ship buried somewhere down on the central waterfront. Undoubtedly, they will find that uh, when they start digging for the tunnel. Likewise, there are some early uh, Native American settlements, and we may find a lot of things uh, in that process as well. And if we can understand better the pattern of settlement, the migratory patterns of camping on the central waterfront by our Native Americans for over a thousand years, uh, we may um, uh, develop a greater appreciation um, for a longer term history than the more recent settlers since the 1850s. Also, where, where in Seattle is the continuously operated souvenir shop, the oldest continuously operated souvenir shop? Well, guess what? It is on the waterfront. And you might take a guess at what um, the name of that shop is. And some of the family member owners are here tonight, I understand. Tammy and Andy James, thank you for being here. Also, what came before Seafair? It was called Fleet Week. What was that event organized around and when? And where is Ballast Island? And why is there a Ballast Island? Well, those are a few of the um, interesting uh, little known facts, let's say, uh, about the central waterfront. There are countless stories uh, to be told, to yet to be told, and to be retold. We are very pleased um, to have the sponsorship of this event tonight of 13 co-sponsors. And I'd like to mention Allied Arts, the Association of King County Historical Society, City Club for Culture, who provided the wonderful cookies and coffee. Thank you very much. Future Wise, History Link, His Historic Seattle, the Museum of History and Industry, the Port of Seattle, Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society, the Seattle Architectural Foundation, the Seattle Public Library for uh, donating this space for this purpose, and the Association of King County Historical Organizations. Now, I'd like to mention also that there are members of city staff here, including Diane Sugimura with the Department of Planning and Development and the Director of the, de of the Planning Division of, the of DPD is here, John Ram. Uh, we also have Council President John Drago, who is going to introduce Paul Dorpat. And um, there are many more I should probably acknowledge, but I think we'll get on with the show. And now I'd like to invite Council President John Drago uh, up to the uh, lectern here and Thank take you. over from here. Thank you. Good, good work. Thank you, Peter. This is a great turnout tonight. And when I thought about why are we here tonight, um, at least for me, the answer was, if we don't know where we've been, how do we know where we want to go? And we have the opportunity to make some change on the waterfront in the next um, decade. So I think it is important to understand where we've been. I guess Peter and I were kind of going along the same track because um, I had some questions as well. Um, and we, I really started with at the Native, um, when the Native Americans were here, and do we know the tribes that walked these shores before the European settlers arrived? And some of these are in kind of headline form. Uh, do, did you know Maynard's Point Cemetery was located on the waterfront. It's now part of the Seattle landfill. Another headline, Seattle garbage routinely dumped into Puget Sound as of 1892. Princess Angeline, daughter of Chief Self, dies May 31st, 1896 in her shack located on the waterfront. J.E. Stan, uh, Stanley opens predecessor to Seattle Ye Old Curiosity Shop. And it became a famous stop for tourists and a market for traditional and newly made Indian artifacts, such as totems and baskets. And it has um, exerted an odd but profound influence on Northwest Indian culture. I didn't read fine, f enough to find out what the, um, that influence was. 
Seattle Chamber of Commerce reports the waterfront highly developed. And uh, we're joined by Port Commissioner Pat Davis here in the front row. Reports high, uh, waterfront highly developed on December 31st, 1901. SS Minnesota sails for Asia with the largest cargo to cross the Pacific, January 22nd, 1905. And it was calling on ports at Yokohama, Kobe, Nagasaki, Shanghai, Manila, and Hong Kong. This is my favorite. Bathing Beach opens in Seattle, June 1st, 1877. And here's the puzzle. There's only one place in downtown Seattle where you can touch the water, and you know where that is. Next one, trees become history along Seattle waterfront when the last one is cut down on June 20th, 1879. And in addition to the old curiosity shop, another uh, influence on the waterfront was Ivar Hagland, who in eight, 1938 established Seattle's first aquarium <coughs> at Pier 54. So what does this all have to do with Paul Dorpat? Well, Paul is the person that can answer the questions. And in addition to that, I fondly note that Paul and I met uh, through Ivor Hagland when Ivor was um, re restoring, redoing his restaurant down on the waterfront, he hired Paul to do the historical piece of that. So if you visited the restaurant, you've seen uh, the photographs and the historical artifacts. So that's where we met. But I didn't know that he came from California. He came to Seattle in the 1960s from California, but he adopted Seattle and has really spent his professional career here um, chronicling the history of his adopted hometown. And he is best known now as the man who collects and publishes photographs of Seattle of the past. His Sunday column in the Seattle Times is Seattle Now and Then, and it has become a fixture in Pacific Magazine. So he's the man that can answer the questions that can tie this all together for us. Where did we come from? And why should those influences, the things that have happened in the past, influence the decisions we make about the future of the waterfront? So let's welcome Paul Dorpat. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, can you all hear uh, with the remote? Let's first of all test the remote. Can you hear? Okay. Now, first of all, we need to apologize to the people up above uh, because you're not going to be able to see the imagery up there in the last rows. Consequently, Stephanie Pure uh, has uh, <laughs> gone to the uh, business here of making this map. So when other people are looking at the slides, you look at the map. Okay. <laughs> In fact, let's all look at the map together right now. And uh, do all of you have a copy or nearly all of you? Okay. Now, uh, I must say that this talk is part of a, a larger project which involves uh, putting together about a 100-page narrative that's accompanied from, by about three to 400 illustrations, which will have a limited edition uh, publication. Probably one of those will wind up in the, in the library here. And then also, this is being videotaped uh, uh, for, uh, for the city channel, although what is this? We're, we're going to discover uh, and find out as we get into it. Um, now, t some of these questions that you brought up, uh, Peter and Jan, um, uh, the, the question about the oldest pier, uh, I'm wondering myself, Peter, do you want to come up and tell us what the pier is or not? <laughs> well, I, I don't care for that mystery, Peter. I want to know now. Come on up here. 
Well, that's right. It is Pier 48. I'm pretty sure it is Pier 48. Because when they changed over, the, the Pacific Coast uh, Company changed their piers there, south of Yesler Way, uh, about 1901. They took some of the old uh, Pier uh, A, the roof, and moved it over the new 48, which wasn't called 48 then. And to answer his first question, when did they change? In fact, this can be the first uh, moment of our audience participation. When did they rationalize all the pier numbers? Uh, actually, 44, uh, during the war. Uh, that's right, uh, there was a, a, a committee that meant for several, uh, several times to decide what to do, and finally the army got tired of it and simply decreed it as an act of war. Uh, <laughs> and so that's how we got the, the rationalized number system. Uh, now, as for the swimming beach, Jan, that uh, was uh, at the foot of Union Street. It was called Jensen's, and he was a Canadian and a, and a captain who retired to open this little resort, and then later a beer parlor. And it didn't last that long because the Ramshorn Railroad curved in front of it soon, soon after that. But uh, the reason he put it at the foot of uh, University Street was, is that that part of the uh, waterfront, which we see right here, right? You can find University Street there, can't you, probably? Or the, oh, the streets aren't named, are they, except for Madison. Well, you figure it. You know Jesus Christ made Seattle under protest and double each one of those, and university is gonna be up there just a little bit, uh, uh, you know, by south of Pike there. Well, the reason he chose it there is because, as the pioneers knew, on the waterfront, if you were at Columbia Street, and the wind was right, if you turned your nose to the south, towards Yester Mill and towards the Duwamish, it would smell, it would stink, sulfuric. But if you turned to the, and it would be gooky. But if you turned to the right, uh, to, the, to the north, it would develop into a sandy beach, and it would have the sweet smell of the waterfront as we uh, can sometimes appreciate it when, when it's not influenced by uh, carbo, uh, hydrocarbons and the like. Uh, so that's why he put his, his swimming beach there. Now, uh, so let's again look at the map, and, and notice the, the original is colored. Uh, and I want to point out that just offshore, you see the darker gray, right? That is all fill now. So that represents all the reclaimed land. That little uh, peninsula that sticks down there, rather like a hypothalamus or, uh, or an Oreo's nest, is what was first called Piner's Point in 1841 by the Wilkes Expedition. And it's after one of his midshipmen, Piner. And you can see Yesler's Wharf sticking out there, sort of right at the neck to the, to, the, uh, to the Piner's Point, and you see the narrow isthmus there that goes from the bay proper into the salt marsh. When the tides were high and the wind was pushing the water, that would wash over there so that Piner's Point effectively became an island, and it was sometimes described as Denny Island. Now this map also shows us where the original claims were set and how they relate to the later city grid that's superimposed on it. So Yesler's grid, for instance, uh, took a sort of a pan, uh, what was it, uh, like a yeah, panhandle. It came down on a long, narrow strip down Yesler Way so that he could bring the logs from the larger part of his, plain, uh, of his uh, claim, which was up on the hill. And what you don't see here is Maynard's name mentioned, and he has everything south of that little strip that Yesler is in. So that by way of introduction. And uh, now we will, uh, again, I want to thank all those organizations uh, for, for helping out with getting the news out about this. And uh, I, I also have one other uh, organization I'd like to thank, and that is Reliance Coffee. So uh, if they can hit it up there, I'll... If you want a beverage that's super picker-upper, then serve Reliance Coffee for your breakfast, lunch, or supper. There you are. Whether now. you live in Everett, Seattle, or Tacoma, you'll say Reliance Coffee stops for flavor and aroma. Now you know that voice, don't you? Yeah, that, that's that's Ivar, as his relatives called him, and any good Scandinavian would call him Ivar. And you know. He came on the waterfront in 38, although he visited ever since he was a kid with his dad and when he was walking home from the University of Washington. 
he'd take the trestle down from Pike Place Market, and there was a long trestle, uh, one of the many different hill climbs on Pike Street, that he'd go down and walk along the waterfront when he was returning home from college in the early uh, eight, uh, 1920s, and always remarked to himself, this is where he wanted to spend his life, was on the waterfront. So he opened, as Jan said, his aquarium in 38, and then he uh, got it on radio, which is what he always wanted to do. He became very knowledgeable about Northwest folk singing, wrote his own songs, and he got Reliance Coffee to sponsor him. So that really gave him his send off. So that during the war, he was doing three things. He was running his aquarium, he was sorting nuts and bolts uh, uh, for Lockheed down on, on Harbor Island, and he was also uh, doing, uh, doing the radio show. And, and that gave him the popularity that let him open the restaurant. Now, why do I give all this time with Ivor? And uh, is because, as Jan noted, it's, although I had done some research on the waterfront before that with waterfront awareness, Paul Chilko, who used to work with the Port of Seattle and I would walk around the waterfront and take pictures together. It was really that uh, invitation by Ivor uh, through uh, Jim Faber. And if you'll turn now on the screen uh, up there, the first slide, oh, I do that. Oh, see, I knew that would be a problem. I'm used to saying next, and I can do it myself here. There we go. It was uh, during that, it, it was that invitation by Ivor. Well, it doesn't seem to be coming on, though. Oh, there we are. There, there's, there's his nibs. Uh, it was during that, uh, that invitation by Ivor to come down and help him sort of uh, give a good heritage coating to his new acres when he would open. He was worried about it. He was worried he was going to be too slick. Well, Jim Faber, the guy on the right here, how many of you remember Jim Faber from anything? Well, if you knew him, he's, he's a prince. He was a marvelous human being. And he, he wrote Steamer's Wake, a very important book on, uh, on, uh, on steaming, you know, the mosquito fleet. And he also did the Anatide, which was the Ferry's newspaper, weekly newspaper. He was the editor of that, among many other things. So, so there we would meet very periodically with Ivor. At one time, uh, someone had written a story about Ivor saying that he was the king of the waterfront. And uh, Susan, who was uh, Jan's friend, who introduced me to Jan, and who was Ivor's uh, last personal assistant, uh, said, well, we should crown him then. And so uh, Jim folded the napkin <laughs> and put it on Ivor's head, and we, we crowned him king of the waterfront at that point. And Ivor lived about another 16 months after that. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is just take you to show you some of the native waterfront. We're going to look at some of the oldest pictures. We're not going to talk much about personal relations. We're going to talk about spatial relations. We're going to try to figure out where the native land was. Uh, we're not going to talk about events much. Or hardly even, I'll mention the gold rush now, and that's it. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at old pictures and, and try to explore them. And we've got two reels to go. That's 160 pictures. The report that we're doing for the city council and for you, that's going to be much bigger and much, much more organized, too, and less, less like a pastiche. It'll be a narrative and be more sensible than what I'm going to be like in the next hour. But here we go. And I have to remember, every once in a while, I will say next, expecting somebody, you know, but I have to do it myself. So let's get going here. And I've got a laser pointer. All right. Well, here you are, right? Recognize this? You are here, you are there. What is this? Nobody. Nobody recognizes this. Isn't that something? The people that are up there in the top, you are there. That's the back of the old Carnegie Library that sat here for many years. It was ivy covered, you see that? Isn't that fan uh, splendid? Well, so you are there, and you are also, is this working? I have to give it a good, healthy, punch. Well, a good way to get a sense about how the city thinks of itself is to look at its tour books and to see how it promotes itself. This is from the late 20s, and this is one of the most grandiose, grandiose notions of what Seattle is. Here it is, the world city that had to be. Uh, uh, going back a little bit later in time, here it is, the U.S. seaport of success, and you can see to the extent to which the identity of the town related to the waterfront and to its links to the sea. That's a seaport of success. Here's another seaport of success. This uh, 
emphasizes the Smith Tower, of course, as did the previous one. And this would be done shortly after the Smith Tower was completed in 1914. And this one here, you really have to hit this very exact. Huh. And this is the Microsoft Auditorium, you know, and I have to push them <laughs> up ready for me. <laughs> the wonder city of the West. You see, uh, the, well, you still see the water there, don't you? Although now we're no longer directly linked to the seaport. And here is a one a little later than that. Now we're really concerned with heritage, showing the uh, dugout canoe. Uh, looks like somebody from Manitoba more than from the North Coast Indians, though. <laughs> And, uh, and then, oh boy, this thing is really sluggish. Yes, uh, 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 Stephanie Pure, please. Let's have a applause for her. Thank you. Yes, uh, next, right there. <laughs> yeah, she can mess it up. Uh, yeah. And look at this marvelous thing. You just hit next. And if I hit, say hit back, you go back. All right, well, well. Let's just forget about the other one and uh, just do this one. This is a really, uh, this has a maritime theme, doesn't it? A shell, and it's a kind of prescience about it, a premonition, I would say, even. And in fact, that is repeated, go ahead, Stephanie, in the next one. You see the shell theme in Seattle's waterfront? Well, we're going to say, I said 160 pictures. We're not doing uh, 24. Well, I think this is prescient of our our shell that we had for a while. Go ahead, on the waterfront, on the tide flats, right there. <laughs> down there. But what this picture also does is it shows us, you know, the great China wall of the Alaska Way Viaduct, as it's been called, and, with, and the big ditch. So here we are in this little funnel. Uh, this is from 84, because they're building the Columbia Tower there. And that's, I, know, I just know that, trust me. Uh, where, how do you do this thing again? <laughs> Is this the laser gun or is it a pen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there's the Columbia Tower going up. And there is that oldest pier, 48, right? And look at how lonely it is down there because that was one string of long piers for a long time. And then it was, you know, been refined down to that one pier. But look at here. Here's this tremendous outburst of containers that started only about 15 years before this. Yes. Uh, can we lower the lights, please? Uh, how are you doing with a video? Lower the lights, please. Yay! Okay. Uh, just forget me. Just do that again. All right. So, uh, uh, oh, next, Stephanie, you're not going to see the show. Can we have a chair for Stephanie? That's okay. That's okay. You're going to ruin your back. Oh, wait. We got a piano stool here. But now that means we're not going to have any musical accompaniment at all, <laughs> which we could have, you know, some adagios, some light music. Oh, oh, here we are in 68. Well, this is the, what, then the 15th year of, at the big curve. The big curve, which is where we've had the big problems recently, right through here. And if we were to check these window, the windows here, uh, we would note that they're between Washington and Yesler Way, and we would see him again in the next picture, and we would learn from the next picture that that wasn't the first trestle on the waterfront. That during the 20s, we had a trestle that went from Washington Street down to Harbor Island. It was decidedly a white elephant. There was no really good reason for it to exist. It was an idea that came up during the World War to supply you know, quicker transportation to the shipyards, and then the shipbuilding industry just went flop. So basically, it was a white elephant. It was torn down in 2930, and this is just when they're tearing it down. Now we're going to go back up and go on the Marion Street overpass. And basically, what we're doing now for the next few slides is looking at Railroad Avenue through time backwards. All right, now, except for this one's about a year later. OK, here we are, Marion Street, looking down what's still then called Railroad Avenue. And this space, which, oh, maybe 20 years, no, 30 years before was all railroads, is now pretty much dedicated to cars down the strip. They've taken these uh, rails right here, which were the westerly most portion of the rails part of Railroad Avenue, and given it over to northbound traffic. And here are the parked cars. 
And you see the little bit of here for near the commission district to supply those. And this is basically dedicated to southbound traffic. For a long time, this was for both ways. Now, the focus is off on the projector. Can you handle the, the projector focus, or do I do that down here? Automatic focus, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can try it, try it a little better. Okay, there, that's better, okay. Oh, here's another shot, uh, a cracked uh, glass negative original. We're looking now back, here's the Marion Street overpass that we were just standing on in 1930. We know the year here is 1911, or 12, pardon me, because look here, they're rebuilding the Coleman Dock Tower after the crash which we'll get to hopefully. And there's the, that wonderful structure which has not got long to live, which we'll also discover later on if I don't spend a lot of time describing each independent slide like I'm doing now. <laughs> but notice how this area right here, they've given over to the, the teams and the, and the wagons. And there are a few cars around at this time and even trucks, but all of this is railroad expense. There's not many cars there though. And the reason for that is that in 1905, the tunnel was completed that allowed a lot of that stuff to move to the south, you know, to the tidelands. So, but let's the next shot, we're gonna go stand, I believe, here and look up, yeah. See, this is just before the tunnel opens, and what a mess of uh, cars there are here. Now, there was a rule that dates back to 82 that says you can only block traffic for five minutes, but that meant for each rail. <laughs> so that you may, you know, take a couple of hours to get across because you'd have, you know, they, they wouldn't cooperate because that, that was the unwritten rule. It would never got written. I call it the Orange Jacobs rule. He was mayor in, uh, I think, 75, 76. He said, it's crazy down there. They should have a commission running that place because all the railroads simply won't cooperate. They won't allow themselves to go over each other's rails with a lot of, without a lot of fees. Consequently, it could take hours to switch, like from one pier to another pier. It really was a, a good example of chaos theory right here on the waterfront. And here's, you're seeing a little bit of it here. And that's good to anticipate the next slide. And I appreciate that, because we have to roll along. Now, the, here's that area that is um, where it allowed for cars. You can see every once in a while on the waterfront, you'd have these holes. Uh, supposedly, that would be where fill could be dropped. This, this is oh. before any seawall. I'm not sure why that hole is there, but there. This is, here's Ivers Pier right here, long before it was Ivers. It's the Kitsap the Transportation Company. The fire station would be right to our left. And this picture almost certainly was taken uh, in order to demonstrate the sad condition of Railroad Avenue. And I think this dates from about 19, uh, da, 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 well, somebody can identify those cars and tell us. Um, all right, let's, let's keep going. Put the whip to my back here. Oh, look at this marvelous shot. This is one I just recently discovered. And in, this, in the 90s, there was still no dedicated portion on Railroad Avenue for teams. You see, the trains went all the way right here to these piers. And these are the old piers that were gotten rid of at the turn of the century and, and replaced with the ones we know and love that are down there now. And when they replaced these, they moved Railroad Avenue out a bit, about that far. So that made this area, that new area, where teams could go that we've seen, you know, because we're going backward in time, right. But isn't this a marvelous, moody picture? And look at, the, here's the waterfront labor. Uh, we've got a couple of saloons here, and uh, yeah. So that's part of waterfront work. Go ahead. Uh, and this is roughly from uh, maybe a year or two earlier and from the same overpass at Madison Street that went to coal bunkers. In fact, where you, when you go eat at Ivers now, you're sitting right in that dining room where there was a big coal bunker through the 90s. And so now we're looking south. And this is the first year after the fire. This is only about, well, the second year. This is about 16 months after the 89 fire destroyed 30 blocks, including all the waterfront south of University Street. Now look at this structure right here. That's the Budlong Boathouse, uh, very near where, where the Coleman Dock. In fact, the Coleman Dock would take up part of that place. Uh, that is going to appear a couple more times in this slideshow. So here we are looking south from Madison Street in 1890. Notice these little pier shadows being thrown out here. This is where those grand piers like Coleman Dock would be built later. Let's go. Oh, sorry. <coughs> now, going back in time, here we are standing on Yesler Wharf right after the fire. And we all know that Yesler was piling up, uh, you know, his sawdust and whatever else he could to make the worms less uh, ravenous for his piers. 
but probably we had no idea, and they had no idea, to the extent of his fill until the fire. See, now this is all fill from his mill. So he effectively had a very secure position on the waterfront there, even though he was a jumper like everybody else, because the state did not yet own the waterfront, right? So all of these people who were using the tidelands were either squatters or jumpers, and they, their legal position was not decided. Uh, and this marvelous show, these showcase buildings were along first between Yesler and Columbia Street. Um, it, there's an irony here. Uh, he put all that work into doing that fill underneath his pier that burned down three times. And in doing that, he didn't certainly have any expectation that a few years after he died, when all of this would be bought by the Northern Pacific Railroad, that they would put in two long piers, which many of you remember as the Alaska docks. They were torn down uh, and turned into parking lots for the World's Fair that they would dredge all of this into a waterway <laughs> and they would build their piers to either side. <clears throat> go ahead. Now, we're going to go, uh, we're going to stay with the fire for a moment and find another natural feature of the, uh, of the waterfront. And this is, where is this? Union Street, right? We're looking down right up at Union Street. And if you notice this structure right here, anybody know the name of that? What is it? I remember when Tom Robbins lived there for a little while back, about 20 years ago. Um, who else? Uh, there's a, a, a novelist. A, a, oh, I can't think of her. Anyway, so this right here was a very steep cliff right here. The steepest cliff, on the, the one place on the waterfront where you had to be really careful. It was precipitous. And I'll prove it to you in the next slide, because we're going back to Yesler's Wharf in about 87, and we're looking at a detail, and there's that cliff right there. And this structure right here is where that building was we just saw. This is the Weed Residence at the northwest corner of First Avenue and Union Street. And there was a wagon road that came right down that you can't see it here, but it was there. Importantly used after the fire because everything pretty much south of there was burned up. Now, we're going to go, remember this, this, this line right here, this roof line and these two roof lines. We're going to go up a little bit after this and be in a building that's, that's that's right here, it's not, doesn't show it, it's not built here yet. Let's go up there, go ahead. Ah, yes, now we're looking down. See, there's that roof line, right? Here's First Avenue, Union Street. Now look out here on the waterfront. This is the waterfront that would burn up. This is the waterfront that has now just two railroad lines, both of them developed in the 80s. One is the Ram's Horn right here, and the other is the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad. This is built in the early 80s, this is built in 87. So this is practically brand new. Here's the jumble of Yesler's Wharf and the long King, Coal, King, King Street Coal Pier. Down here is the, make note of this, there's the Opera House, Fry's Opera House at Madison Street and those fancy buildings that we saw the ruins of a moment ago. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. How are you doing in the back rows? You enjoying the map? Yeah. <laughs> all right, good. <clears throat> I'll try, I should, I should refer to the map more often, I'm sorry. Uh, well, uh, there's going to be a, 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 a next shot. Okay, oh, yeah, this is a nice, this is a, a good moment. No, all right, that's all right, we did it. <laughs> well, you, had a, you were titillated. Uh, anyway, here, here it is. Imagine all of this burning down, which is exactly what happened. Let's, let's take the, now, oh, I know what. We're going to go down where this house is right here, the weed house, except it's no longer there at the time of the fire. It has... Um, been replaced by a big apartment house. So we're going to go stand in the window of an apartment house and look down on the ruins in this direction. Go ahead. Go ahead. There. And if the, the clever eyes among you will see, there's the ram's horn right there, right? And there's the Seattle Lake Shore and Eastern. And look at this. They're already building a warehouse over the ram's horn. And of course, there's all sorts of litigation going on for years and years over that and much else. And they're building platforms. So this is about mm, a month and a half after the fire. You see this structure right here? Do any of you remember the Bay Building? That is where, uh, it was at the southwest corner of Union and First. It was torn down and then they had that big hole there for a long time. Well, the Bay Building, that foundation, when it was lower than that, was what stopped the fire as it was moving up the waterfront. You see this white soil right here? That's a Seneca Street. It's an old cracker factory that's been torn down the walls. We're going to see that in a moment. 
Uh, there's a lot else to discuss here, but we're just going to move right along. Go ahead. There. There's the Cracker Factory wall. It's not been torn down yet. And there it's been it torn down. So let's go back, Stephanie. All right. We're going to go stand down right here. And this is supposed to be self-focusing. And, and we're going to stand right about down here in the next slide and look back over this direction. Go ahead there, although they haven't started to cap the old pilings yet that were burnt in the fire with new pilings. There's that foundation that stopped the fire at University Street, which is right here. And here's Seneca Street right here with the cracker factory right here. Now I want you to notice, now we're going to make a point about the natural environment of the waterfront. There were three ravines that interrupted the varying heights of the bank that went from uh, King Street north to Broad Street. And the second of these ravines was this one right here at Seneca Street. It was quite a bit deeper than you see it there. It's exposed by the fire. It went quite a ways back, and we'll see other evidences later on. It was also the site where the Indians used as a burial ground. So there probably are a few Indian uh, burial sites still in this that were covered up by the seawall that was built here in 76 and has been burnt by the fire. Now, if we look here, down, we'll see that same area right here. So Seneca would be right here. This is University. There's the uh, Arthur and Mary Denny's Orchard at University of First. And there's the Denny home. There's what we called the, you know, the, the parents of Seattle. There, there they are right there at the corner of Union and First. All right, now let's go on. <coughs> oh, is that a trolley? Thank you. Somebody asked a question. That's very nice. Uh, let's back up. Yeah, trolley. And you know what kind of trolley that is? That's a cable car. There was still a front street cable system then. It hadn't changed to electric yet. Go ahead. Oh, that's the same shot. It's too dark in here uh, in Microsoft Auditorium to see this. But uh, <laughs> there it is. That There's Seneca Street again. Go ahead. Look at that. <clears throat> now, there's that hole. You remember that between University and Seneca, well, that's, that's that block where the Arlington Hotel was and, the, and two other hotels, the names of which escape me right now. And, if we, and this, this view, let's back up and look at a view from about 82. Now, let me go forward uh, from 82. Uh, you know, by the way, see, this is all masonry connected with those hotels, and it goes against the old seawall that was built in 76. And when they went in here to do Harbor Steps, they discovered parts of that old seawall from 76. I got, a, I got a call on that from somebody. Now let's back up. Uh, I don't mean back up, I mean forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. Well, there's the same wall looking from the complete distance, the complete reach of Alaska Way or Railroad Avenue. You can see that what, how far the old uh, native shoreline is from where we are today. And do any of you remember uh, Ernie Kovacs as uh, Big Brother, those big uh, oversized posters that were plastered on the pillars about 25 years ago? Well, there they are, again, again, okay. Go ahead. Walt, do you know who did that? Walt Crowley? <laughs> Walt? Did you leave, Walt? I think he did. Yeah, that's, Walt shows up and then he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, here we are. Uh, now, now we're going to introduce to you a couple of the earliest photographs. And this is the most intimate detail of the waterfront. This is uh, done from 1869, from the end of uh, Yesler's Wharf. It's quite early. And although there's a picture that shows some of this from 64, which we'll see, this is the one that really has the detail. So we go from Columbia Street here to Marion Street to Madison Street. So you see the original lay of the land. It's been some grading here, but not a lot. And you can see the tides, and this isn't the highest tide, but they go right up to the street. This is Yesler's Mill Pond right here. There's the Territorial University off in the hills at 4th and Seneca. And here's the Brown Church at 2nd and Madison. <coughs> now, the, <coughs> What's that? Is that First Avenue? That's Front Street or First Avenue. Yeah, Front and First are the same thing. The next scene is taken nine years later by Peterson Brothers, uh, who gave us very important photographs from the late 70s, early 80s. Next, <clears throat> there. Same, also taken from Yesler's Wharf and showing from Columbia Street here 
Marion, and Madison. So now you see it's First Avenue has been built up behind a timber cribbing, and, uh, and, it's, and of course the town is, being, is filling in considerably here. And right here, uh, Peter, what's this? That's the hull of the windward. Yes, windward. that's it. Yeah, that's the that's the boats that's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath Western Avenue, uh, somewhere near that parking lot, probably in the parking lot where the old uh, Sea Candy Candy, that beautiful. Well, we'll see that. All right, uh, all right. Oh, here's the new, the church again. It's now got a mansard roof. It's changed a bit, so it's the second version. Here's Plymouth Congregational up on Second, up towards Spring Street. Next. <clears throat> oh, this is the, not the same day, but the same time, roughly, by the same photographer. The, the tide's a little lower. He's turned to show us Columbia Street here. <laughs> and right here is the elephant store at the uh, southeast corner of Columbia. But again, look at these shacks here. They would be flooded right up to their front door at, when the tide got up. Is there a sidewalk on Oh, yeah, there'll be a sidewalk. The promenade is... <clears throat> oh yeah, they would have made sidewalks. Sure, that, those are the they they have made sidewalks before they made streets, because they had to walk before they could, you know, had teams or anything like that. So, but the sidewalk on this street is on the other side of the street, away from the, you know, away from the bay. Now the next shot, go ahead, is uh, standing at the front porch of the studio, the Peterson Brothers Studio, which is uh, at the foot of Cherry Street, and they're looking up front. So there's the elephant store, Columbia, Marion Street, Madison, right here. We're going to wind up on that balcony in a moment. But first of all, we're going to go with the Peterson Brothers up First Avenue to Pike Street and climb up here onto Denny Hill and look back. Go ahead. There. And there, we've seen this house before. That's the Denny home at the southeast corner of Front or First and Union. There's the bark windward right there. There's the sprawl of Yester's Wharf and the King Street Wharf when it's practically new. Again, this is 1878. And here's the trestle of the Seattle and Walla Walla Railroad, which we're not going to describe the, the history of it here, but it'll be, it'll be in the writing. This is the railroad that was built. Well, here I am describing it. Uh, <laughs> that was built by the locals to compete with the Northern Pacific. They called it Seattle of Walla Walla, thinking they were going to get to Walla Walla and hook up there with the transcontinental. But they, more importantly, they got to the coal fields of Renton and Newcastle so that it became really the lifeblood, coal became the lifeblood of Seattle economy during the, uh, during the 70s and part of the 80s as well. Uh, so now the next shot, we're going to go down to Madison Street and stand on that balcony that I mentioned a moment ago. Go ahead. Yes, and we're looking now back at the front porch of their studio. We can see Yesler's Wharf here. We see the tide coming into First Avenue. We see the boardwalk. We also see right here a Mr. Piper and his dog. I'm not sure if his dog is Hal and his son is Jack or his dog is Jack and his son is Hal. <laughs> Now, he was a city council person, and he was also the candy maker, and he was also a, a, a practical joker of the, of, of the tender sort. You know, he had a good wit about him. He was a very loved character. He was the first socialist on the, on the Seattle City Council. Um, <laughs> he was a well-loved guy. Uh, one time he went uh, dressed to, uh, as Henry Esler to a uh, masquerade party and was so convincing that Henry Esler went home and got a sign put on his own costume to saying the real Henry Esler. <laughs> so. uh, but go ahead. This is 78 again. <clears throat> got to move along. Okay, now we're going back on Esler's Wharf. Remember, we've been there several times. We're going now forward in time. This is uh, the last time we were there was 78. This is 686. And you can see it's really building up now. There's that Fry Opera House, which I pointed out to you a little bit earlier. And here's that. Do you remember when we were standing on that trestle over Madison Street, looking up Railroad Avenue? I said, pay attention to that, that, bo that boathouse. There it is again, see? And here it is before the fire, which means it survived the fire because they floated it out in the bay. Then they brought it back and tied it up there again. So this is the foot of Madison, Marion Street right there in Madison. And there's the, the church again. Now they've got a third sanctuary. They've added, made it, changed it again. 
They did that in 84. And these marvelous structures back here all have wonderful stories, which we're completely going to neglect at this moment. But we're going to now follow the fire, OK? We've seen it once. We're going to see it again. We're going to see the fire now from Spring Street looking by, back down here, because the fire starts right here. Go ahead, in that building. <coughs> there. Here the fire is at Madison, or at, right there, and it's, it's jumped across, and it set the Opera House on fire. And in another six hours after, after this, 30 plus city blocks would be destroyed, and everything on the waterfront south of Uni University Street would be destroyed. Shall we break for a cookie? No, let's not. No. <coughs> My throat's getting it. Huh? Uh, the story is that it started uh, by the stupid act of trying to put out a fire made with hot glue with water on shavings on the floor of a cabinet shop, which just spread the fire because the glue in the water. You know, it, it wouldn't uh, grab the fire. It's like napalm. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. OK, now, uh, here, this is another view of the, the waterfront. And this is very revealing in, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, we see that they brought back the uh, Budlong Boathouse right here. We can see the Coleman Dock right here, the earliest version of it. And look how far Yesler sticks out here. That's where we were standing, remember, to look back here. This is Columbia Street. There's the Opera House. And this distinguished line of buildings was that marvelous, those structures that we saw from Yesler's Wharf a while ago. Remember when we looked from the ruins? Yeah, OK. Now let's go down this street and look back at these ruins a little bit later after this. Go ahead. <coughs> Stephanie, it's really great. You're, you're doing that very well, you know, the technique with that. And here you see the same ruins. Here's Columbia Opera House. Now, what do we see here? <coughs> very revealing. First of all, after you have a fire in which 30 city blocks are destroyed, what do you do with the stuff? You dump it in the bay. So you know there's going to be a whole bunch of remnants from the city, Pioneer City, that are out in the bay. They're probably not out as far as the, as the, as the viaduct. They're probably even closer. We can see from this picture that even before the fire, they were dumping stuff at the street ends. See how far out the street ends go from, from the old? And this had to all be done in the 80s, because we, we saw in 78 uh, that, that that wasn't like that at all, right? So of course, those were the boom years. What was the population of Seattle in 1880? It was like 3,500 something. What was it in 1890? About 40,000. What was it in turn of the century? About 100,000. In 1910, over 230,000. So it was a boom, boom town that just grew grotesquely. Yes? This is first right here. Keep reminding me that, that I don't say things like that. Yeah, this is first. And you can see there's the cable slot right there. See it? <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is a third and Marion, second and Marion right here. OK, looking up then with our backs to Cherry Street, looking up the waterfront right after the fire. Go ahead. And this is to show you what that stretch of lovely buildings looked like before the fire. This is from 87 when they're planking Front Street or First Avenue. And we're looking south here from Columbia towards Pioneer Square. Marvelous structures, all ceramic, but all of them went down with the fire. Go ahead. Did part of the Coleman building survive the fire? Uh, a lot of parts of buildings survive, but only the uh, Dexter Horton Bank, which was small and very solid, was reused for a while at, at Maine and First. Uh, and there were buildings that were on the east side of Second Avenue that they just had, they were scorched as all, and their windows were broken, but they were sort of, the flames were beat back with, with wet blankets and the like. That includes also City Hall, which was uh, uh, where the City Hall Park is. That was beat back with people, you know, dousing it with wet blankets. And they, in fact, some of the prisoners from the city jail were helping with that. <clears throat> and, uh, but they were not released afterwards. They were <clears throat> put back in jail, which they were thankful for because well, that's something else. Uh, now, we're, here we are at, on the uh, back. This is the first bird's eye you're looking. There's a lot of wonderful bird's eyes of the history of the city. This is the earliest from 78. And there's that wharf. This is from 78 again, remember? So we were standing out here looking right to Madison Street and seeing these structures and the like. All right. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not actually a bird didn't shoot this. That's right. 
uh, and there's, it, look at the, the railroad coming in here from Lake Union, coming up West Lake. It's going to turn on Pike's, Pike Street and go out to the Pike Street Coal Wharf, which if I get going a little faster than I'm going, we'll see before you all want to run home. This is 78, 78 bird's eye. You remember seeing these structures? There's the 76 seawall. Some more wharfs are being put out here. And, uh, and we, the big building in the middle, or right here, that's Territorial University. That's where the four, Olympic Four Seasons Hotel is, Fourth and, Fourth and Seneca. Fourth Avenue then does not go through beyond Seneca. It's the campus then. You had to go to Union to get Fourth Avenue again. All right, there were probably other reasons to have this up. Go ahead. Go ahead. How you doing back there? Really? I, I, I can't imagine. Uh, All right, now, oh, this is, you remember the Peterson shots from 78? We've seen two of them from the, the wharf, right? That showed the, 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 uh, the seawall. Now, this is the same studio about the same time. Now we're looking north. We're seeing Denny Hill, which we've seen a while ago from the front of their studio. And we're, we're looking up here to the corner of Union Street right here. There's the, the, Denny ho the Denny home again at Union. Across the street is the Orion family home. Uh, here's the Brown home between Seneca and Spring. In fact, I think in the next picture, we're going to go and look at this building, if I'm not mistaken, and see how it survived the building of the city. Go ahead, let's see. Yes, there it is. <laughs> Look at the old, the native ground right there. See that? Interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, there's your, there's your Diller Hotel and uh, your arcade building. And this is where the, the art museum is today. But, but no okay. awnings. Yeah. What's that? And they believe in awnings. Yeah. A lot of awnings, yeah, quite nice. All right, now let's go back to the wharf. Go ahead. And uh, back to the wharf. Yeah, this is a detail of the shot we just saw. Remember we were mentioning the Seneca Ravine? Okay, here it really shows up. Here it is right here. See the bridge going across it on the east side of Front Street? And notice this wet area on the seawall. Well, that's because it's being irrigated by the ravine and it's, it's growing its own habitat. And we go up here to Union Street, one block. It's a long block from University right here to Union Street, much longer than from uh, Seneca. And if you look at your map, it's still that way. And there's the Arthur Denny home across the street is his son, Orion, and the wagon road on Wall, on, pardon me, on Union. Now let's go look at the Orion home. Go ahead. I believe, yes, there you are. Looking up Union, front or first, next. And a building that followed it in the uh, uh, late 1890s. We're still looking down from the yard of his father, the Arthur and Mary Denny's home. Pike Place Market right up here. There's the old York Hotel that had to be torn down when they put the tunnel under the city. Go ahead, because it undermined it. And then that's what's there today, only this is from the 70s. Looks like Royer right there, doesn't it? No. <laughs> Hey, maybe he's visiting. No, he wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> Next. Okay. All right. Now, we've seen this before, and we're sort of using it to orient ourselves. We're back on Yesler's Wharf with the first detailed shot of the waterfront. We again see no seawall. We're going from Columbia Marion to Madison. And the next shot, I don't remember. Oh, I think I know what it is. Go ahead. It's going to be the viaduct, I bet. Let's see. Go ahead. Ah, I'm right. <laughs> This is roughly a repeat of that last shot, pretty rough. I mean, I think that the photographer of this shot, which was me, could have had a conversation with, uh, with Robinson if we could have bridged time. You know, we might have, hey, uh, George, something like that. But I think we could have talked. And here I am on Coleman Dock at the um, southeast corner of Coleman Dock, uh, looking down uh, across Alaska Way to the viaduct. And notice that it really is a Chinese wall. It really does separate the waterfront from the city. But when it was first opened, it, it was open to photographers first. So now we're going to take a tour along the top of the, uh, of the viaduct and uh, see what we saw before the traffic was on it. OK? And we'll start uh, at its north end. Go ahead, Steph. There. Now, I know the focuses can be better than that. So. <coughs> Yeah, that's good enough, okay. 
So here we are looking down from, oh, probably near Virginia Street, and right to our left will be what? The yeah, the market, but what else? The armory. the armory, very good. In fact, the next slide, if we turn, go ahead. There is where, there's the old armory. And again, I apologize for the focus. It really is better than that. But they're, everybody's so used to PowerPoint, you know, they, the whole, the whole uh, technique of doing slides, it's lost, you know. Uh, it's like focus, it's called focus, you know. Uh, uh, anyway, here we are, uh, yeah, lovely old structure. It's sort of, uh, you know, I have a friend who built his home out of these bricks when, when they <laughs> tore it down. Go ahead. Going down a little bit further, here's the old uh, power plant, steam plant between um, Union and University. Remember, this is 53. We're taking a walk on, on the top in 53. Go ahead. The viaduct opened to traffic three days after April Fool's 1953. Uh, here we are a little further, down between University and Spring. Continuing. Uh, here we are looking up Spring Street, and we're looking up the future site of the library right up here. Uh, thank you for the focus. Go ahead. Uh, and here we are looking up Madison Street. Continue. Uh, up uh, Columbia. Uh, these photographers are apparently going the other way. Actually, I think we're going the opposite direction of where the photographers were going, but next one. Uh, here we are paused at Cherry Street and Yesler Way to uh, reflect on the tower, I suppose. Uh, for, uh, somehow, the, one of these, the cameraman that's holding this camera, whose name was Horace Sykes, he, was, uh, he managed to get down to the lower deck. I don't know how he did it, but go ahead. He took this shot. Uh, there. Uh, focus. Is there a focus thing on, on this manual I have down here? Then why isn't it focused? Oh, that's lousy. Uh, those are really sharp slides, so. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm not. I, um, <clears throat> next. Now, we went down a little bit further and they ran into these, these red, I don't, you know, I don't know if they're a company, but this is a marvelous shot, isn't it? Showing the city and the, and uh, most of the imagery here that they shot was to the city side, but there were a couple of them that looked down on the waterfront. Let's look at the next one. Okay, where, where is this? That's right, Pier 48 off to the left, and this is the remnant of 49 right there. There's the pergola that was built in 1920 to welcome the ships. And there's the old long pier of the, uh, that was the, the railroad pier that the Alaska steamship ran out of for a long time. It was one of the twin piers. Remember I told you about Yesler Wharf being you know, dredged? Well, this is to either side of it. Okay, go ahead. And there is uh, the Art Deco 1930s version of Coleman Dock south face. It's not a very distinguished face. It's better on the waterfront right here. And there's, of course, is the Kalakla, adding a little touch of class to it. Go ahead. Now, the viaduct, which we have just uh, walked down uh, before the traffic could get to it, is actually an old notion. And here we see a 1945, or is it 7? 45 uh, proposal uh, for a elevated along the waterfront. It would link up with another uh, uh, limited access highway along Boren Avenue. This is the precursor of I-5 at Denny Way with an elevated over Westlake to go to Aurora and go out, of course, the Speedway. And here you notice that depressed roadway on Broad Street. There it's an open pit. It's not a tunnel there. And this comes out of the, uh, the engineering department. But the idea for many parts of this go back to the 20s already. Uh, there are descriptions of elevateds on Alaska Way in the 20s. And, and really the waterfront has been sort of the scene of two opposing forces, the north-south and the east-west. How to get goods to the, to, the, to the docks and off the docks 
and how to get through the city. And these two forces have <laughs> been at war with one another or had a trouble with, you know, coordinating for a, in many, many great stories of the waterfront detail those troubles. Go ahead. Here they are constructing the piers. I mean, the, the, pardon me, the trestle. Here we are at Virginia Street in sort of 52 probably. This thing went up pretty quick. It, it, they got it finished before they had to. And uh, the, the, actually, Ivor Hagelin is living in this place right here at this, at this moment. He had a fire and he was driven out of it in 56. Go ahead. There they are earlier, the Gaffney Dock and the Virginia Street Dock at the foot of Virginia. And there's the Virginia overpass. And you can see a little room here for anything but rails. This is quite early, probably about 1905. Go ahead. <coughs> here we are at Virginia Street looking up at the hill, Denny Hill. There's the Denny Hotel or the Washington Hotel. And you can see some brave soul would try to get down Virginia to the waterfront, go down that if they there. It's right here where the ridge starts again, sort of halfway between Virginia and Pike, a ridge starts to form. So if you go any distance in that direction from Virginia, it starts to get somewhat precipitous and you're really not going to negotiate it except with steep uh, stairways and ladders. And there was squatters community along this beach for a very long time, go ahead, in the 90s and up until about 1903. Here we are looking from King Street Coal Wharf and for a last view at, at uh, Virginia Street right there. Coming down, here's Virginia and, and Western right here coming down the hill. And remember that little, that part that was so steep? There it is right there. So this is before any of the real piers that we're familiar with were built along the central waterfront. These are the precursors of that. And here's the public market would be right up here. And of course, there is no Pike Place yet. This is about 91 or 92, go ahead. Now, we're gonna visit with Mr. Peterson, George Peterson again, and his most important imagery. In fact, the next image we're gonna see, not the next one, but nearly so, is perhaps the most exhilarating, important image ever photographed of Seattle, as historical image, which you're gonna see and share with you in a moment. And first of all, we're going to point out something here about Plummer's Wharf. In his history on Seattle, uh, the um, uh, Clarence Bagley indicates that Yesler's Wharf really was all that was really needed through pioneer times up until the mid-70s. And so that wharfs like Plumber's, and he uses Plumber's Wharf as an example, fell into disrepair. This is Plumber's Wharf on Washington Street, on Main Street. And this is First Avenue right here. So Bread of Life Mission right here. Bagley, uh, Elliott Bay Books right over here. So if we go up into this window, we're gonna see a picture that George, Washington, George uh, Robinson took in 69 of the, um, panorama of the entire city. But first, we're gonna climb up here on the ridge of this roof, and there is a ladder right up on the other side, and go with E.M. Samus, who was the city's first resident photographer, and see his panorama, the first real panorama of the city. Go ahead. There it is. And we do see the waterfront here, a little bit right off on the left here, see? Some of this is even familiar, the swoop up to, to Marion Street, then down to uh, Madison Street, the church, the university. First Avenue, Yesler Way, the mill is hidden. It's the first mill here still. So this is dates from 64 or 65. Go ahead. But here's Robinson's shot, I believe. No, it's not. The other thing that E.M. Samus did when he was in town, besides trade portraits for vegetables, is he took the portrait of Chief Seattle and that's it. And it was in fact, where Elliott Bay Books is today is where his studio was, where he took this picture. Go ahead. Now, there is the Robinson panorama. And it stretches all the way from Magnolia to First Hill. And here's, here again is First Avenue South. This roof effectively, he didn't get on the roof. He shot from the second floor window. So this roof right here blocked a lot of his view. But we see a lot of the central waterfront right here. And we'll look at a detail of this and hope that it's in focus enough so I can point some things out. Go ahead. All right, there is the earliest shot of Yesler's Wharf. There is something you're familiar with. That's the Denny home at Union Street. Here's the, the, the timber on Denny Hill, you can almost count it. You go down Union Street to the waterfront, Pike Street about here, uh, Virginia right about here, the, the, 
the bluff starts to form right here, and then it continues and it dips down right here into uh, a, a ravine at Bell Street, then it comes up again and it peters out at Wall Street and it reaches Broad Street right there. And now we're gonna look at a detail of this section right now, because we can see the ravine again right there, the Seneca Ravine right there, go ahead, the green belt along its south edge, there it is. And there is the bridge right there that went over Seneca. There was even, you know, before the seawall, there was a bridge over Seneca, over the Seneca Ravine. There's again is the Denny home up at Union Street and First Avenue. And here's the beach. Uh, probably the beach here, right at the base of about Madison Street and Marion Street. Go ahead. <coughs> and there is the best picture you'll see tonight of the Denny home, and that's the last time you're going to see it, too, I think. <laughs> uh, it stayed there a long time. They built it in the 60s, and they lived there until they died in the 90s. Go ahead. Now we're going to look at Piner's Point, and on your map that you're holding, I already referred to that map from 50, uh, 56 by Phelps as being Piner's Point. Here you see it actually named Piner, Piner's Point. And that was by Lieutenant Wilkes, who, who uh, was the, led the exhibition known expedition <laughs> uh, of, uh, for the Navy. And one of the places they uh, explored was Puget Sound. He named a lot of the waters. He named Elliott Bay, and he named Piner's Point. So uh, let's see whether you got, got this figured out. What street would be right here? King, right. What street would be right here? Yesler. Yesler Way right here. What street would be right here? What? Remember the, the waterfront turns at Union Street. And there's that cliff at Union Street. See, Pike would be right here. So even in this most crude kind of stylized description, at least we can project those things there. Whether they really saw them, and that might just be style and, and because of the, well, the chaos factor again, I think we can uh, describe them the way we want. But we know that's King Street, and there's that salt marsh that you see on your, on your uh, map. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> I think it's a wide angle of Wilkes. Point Roberts is Elkey Point. Point Moore is Duwamish Head. There's Piner's Point. And there's the first hydrographics. And those are really important and, uh, regarding sighting the sound and later problems with docking deep ships and the like, which will be in the report, but we can't get into it here. Go ahead. I think Fathoms, probably, yeah. Uh, there, and here is a later one. That was 41. This is 54. It's the Coast Survey. And here now we have Seattle, because they've been over here two years. We still have the salt marsh and, and the sand spit that comes over on uh, Main Street. And there's the, uh, the dapple of buildings there, and Yesler's Wharf would be right there. The next shot, go ahead, <coughs> is a detail of that. There's that turn in the, in the coastline again, right? That's where Union Street is right there. And notice, this is where, you know, our seashell would, or, or our scallop, or our, now our Safeco, or our, down here in the tide flats. And so all of this is fill, and a lot of it's fill out, out here. And of course, all of this is fill, too. Some marvelous descriptions of that fill at the time it was being done, which will be in the report. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, there, that's the map you hold in your hands, and that was done by Lieutenant Phillips. And notice the Indian camp here. This is during the Battle of Seattle in the Indian War. So this says the woods are thronged with Indians. And he's got the blockhouse up here. Actually, it was right here at Cherry Street. It's wrong, and uh, he was on the Decatur. And they were blasting them and, the, you know, using their shells or howitzers. And without that ship, probably... The, the about 400 uh, natives, in the, they could have stormed the blockhouse and really they could have massacred the community effectively. But w the, the ship really saved them. Which uh, it was mostly tribes from the east side of the mountain, from the Yakimas, and they came over. Uh, and there's the salt marsh, you see. So here, let's figure this out. Here's Jackson Street, King Street. This is, we're going to see this in a moment the southwest corner there. Here would be, uh, this is, this is uh, Main Street, and Washington Street would be right in here where the tides could flow across, and Yesler. 
So if you went and stood now at, um, at that, well, let's say, let's go down to Jackson Street at about 3rd Avenue or 2nd Avenue Extension, you'd be looking right up into this. And you get a feel for it, you know? It is kind of, feels sort of like a little indented there a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah, is this the last one? Uh, it's 10 to 7. Uh, oh, you know, we're, we're really, I really am slow, so let's keep going. Uh, here is the, um, here's the waterfront sketch that he did, uh, the, the lieutenant. Uh, and you see there's the peninsula, here's the, there's the wharf, there's the, uh, uh, the, the Felker house, which was the first house built of finished wood from this wood, from this, from this mill right here. And there's the block house. He did put the block house in the proper place on his sketch. Go ahead. I think the next shot shows us a more stylized version of the same earliest sketch of the community. This was done by uh, a contemporary right now, uh, Je Hewlett Jackson, maritime artist. And the tide, the tide flats are down here. Yeah, this is the bay. Go ahead. Uh, there, there's a detail of the Felger House. The next shot is going to show us a picture of it. Go ahead. There's the Felker House. Okay, go ahead. Uh, here is that panorama looking from, we've seen part of this earlier, and uh, here's the, all of the, the Peterson shots from Yesler's War combined together now. And here's another Peterson shot, which we're going to examine next. Go ahead. There. You see, there's your southwest corner of Piner's Point, right there and right there. This shot is taken from this water tower. This is the King Street Coal Wharf. There's Jackson Street. First Avenue is just beyond that. There's the Felker House. There's the Felker House. Yes, there's Wharf. Benny Hill, go ahead. Ah, this is what, back up, please. Uh, sorry, we're going to have to take this time. Let's go stand right down about here and look across at this shack. Go ahead. And that's what we'd see today. You know where that is? That's right at King and the waterfront, right underneath the viaduct. Go ahead. Uh, this is uh, Eby, Isaac Eby, who was here in 1950 before the Denny Party and the like showed up in 51 and visited with Chief Seattle on this point and participated in a, in a festival in the Longhouse for the return of the salmon. Go ahead. So that, that was really the native community right there. And there's that same southwest corner of Piner's Point from the 78 uh, bird's eye, and you'll notice down here at Washington Street, the Indians on the waterfront there, that's the same place where we saw the Indians in the Robison photograph with, no, we haven't seen that yet, have we? <laughs> have we seen that? Oh boy, I'm lost now myself, okay. But I think we saw Yesler's Wharf very early and then the, the Indian canoes to the left. Well, that's the same place. There's Yesler's Wharf right there, go ahead. And here's a very early shot of the King Street Coal Wharf, which, uh, took over in 78 from the Pike Street Coal Wharf. Keep going. How about if I just stamp like this? Okay. There's a detail of Yester's Wharf and a couple of wharfs that were on Washington Street. And you see these pilings out here? Those are the ravages of the Toretto worms of the Pike Street Coal Wharf, which we'll see in a bit. Uh, oh, here's the building of Ballast Island at the foot of Washington Street, about 82. Go ahead. Uh, here it is again, only it's corralled now, and they're building this, the city and ocean docks, and this would be 82 as well, or early 83. So this is really boom town now, and, and the transcontinental reaches the Puget Sound in this year in 83, go ahead, or 82 is, is probably what this is. And there's the docks that were built. Now behind this, in, in the cradle of this was Ballast Island. Now you see this building right here? That's the the Occidental Hotel, which is where the triangular block is, where the sinking ship hotel is today. We'll go stand on the roof of that. We're going to look back and see Ballast Island behind this. Go ahead. What, why is it called? There it is, see? Why is it called Ballast Island? Because it's ship's ballast brought here, here and dumped there so that they go over to the King Street Coal Wharf and pick up the coal, right? <laughs> and there was a lot of them doing it. And after 81, it was mostly steamers. So a lot of this stuff came from steamers, not from sailing ships. All right, keep going. <clears throat> there it is in a map, Main Street, Washington, First Avenue. The, the viaduct goes right through here. 
And so Pier 48 really starts about here. The parking lot for Pier 48 is right about here. Alaska Way is right here, the surface street, going over Ballast Island. Go ahead. And that, that's dirt from South America, from Hawaii, from Telegraph Hill, from Asia, you know. And the irony is that that's where the natives were made to camp, you know. I mean, Native America, they, had a, this, they spent their, those years on, on foreign land. <laughs> that was from 88, actually. This is from 93, because the Great Northern Railroad got here. But it's still there. And these are the new piers. Go ahead. After the fire. Same place. Uh, going back to the fire, you can see the King Street Coal Wharf there. But let's keep going. Uh, here's the Ballast Island before they get the piers built around it following the fire. Go ahead. <clears throat> and again, it's right back here. You can see a little bit of the dirt right here. So these are the new piers that took the place of the ones that burned in the fire. This is very soon after the fire, 91, see? Two years after the fire. Go ahead. And it is a boom town. Boy, is it a boom town. Uh, here it is. Behind that pier is Ballast Island with the Indian watchers. There was no television, you know. It was a good recreation. Go ahead. Uh, and on the other side of the quay, looking up uh, uh, Main, Washington Street, uh, this gridiron, where you could put a, a, a vessel there and the tie went down, you could unload it. This structure right here is still there. This is, this is nestles against the Alaska Way Viaduct at Washington Street, right here. Go ahead. Uh, this is too complicated to get into in this short chase through history, but this is the change in the waterfront that happened on that stretch of the waterfront between 1901 and 1903. So we'll just go on. It'll be in the book. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, there are the, 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 um, the new piers that took the place of the Pacific Coast piers. And there is your Pier 48 in an early version of it. This picture right here is taken sometime early 20th century, probably about, oh, 1907, 1908. Go ahead. Uh, there's 48 when it still sort of has rivals in, in, in 47, not 49 so much, but look at 46, the, the Union Pacific Pier. And here are those two Northern Pacific piers that were Alaska docks, and there's Yesler Way. So there's where old Yesler Wharf was right there, and they had to dredge it out, West Seattle. Now let's see how this thing has grown and basically taken over everything. Oh, this is from the 20s, because remember that trestle we saw near the beginning that came from Washington Street? There it is. Now let's go look at the next shot, which is from 94, I think. No, 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 this is not. This is from about 72. The, this is the first work with, with uh, containers. And here the Alaska ferries are at 48. Here's the Alaska piers at Yesler Way. 49 is effectively gone. 47 is gone. Of course, 42 is the container field, all the way south to 36. Go ahead. Uh, this pergola, which we visited before, was built in 1920. It was the Harbor Patrol here. It was here after 1927. They put floats for small boats. The Harbor Patrol had offices in the Pacific, uh, this Yesler Pier here, and they had a radio station, too. Marvelous history to that structure. Let's go, but not in this dash, we won't hear it. <clears throat> uh, here's the, okay, that's a quiz. What is that? Some of you, uh, what is that vessel? Uh, yes, yeah, somebody got it right. Uh, World's, Fair. World's Fair. Dominion, that's right. That visited as a hotel ship during the World's Fair. Go ahead. And there we go. There's, there's your Yesler's Wharf. Go ahead, the earliest picture. This, is, this vessel is, uh, the, um, was brought Seward to this dock this year as he was going north to, to prove Alaska, you know, to claim Alaska. He came and visited the citizens in this wharf and said what a great future they were going to have in the year this picture was taken. In fact, he may be leaving on it right there. Go ahead. Secretary Seward. Uh, here's the second... This is the second of the uh, Yesler mills. Uh, go ahead. That burned down in 79, and this is the third of the Yesler mills that burned down in 87. And then he didn't build another mill there because it was too valuable for mills. The, his pier was too valuable by then. Go ahead. Uh, here we are looking up 
after the fire, and uh, they're still building the new docks at the foot of Washington Street. Go ahead. Uh, and here is really, oh heck, this is early 20th century because there's, there's uh, Galbraith's dock where Ivers is today. But we still have the stubby docks along here in the early part of the 20th century before Coleman and Grand shrunk it in there. Go ahead. Uh, here we are, Yesler Wharf, looking up that hole again. Go ahead. Uh, this is the strike, the 34 uh, coast, coast marine workers strike from 34. These people are preventing the Victoria from loading during that strike. Go ahead. Uh, here we are looking down at Coleman Dock, Grand Trunk Dock, Ivers Dock, the two Yesler docks, which are, have been stripped for the World's Fair. There's the Dominion Republic. Uh, Dominion Monarch for the World's Fair hotel ship, and there's 48. Uh, oh, that you did I did I actually ask you to ask that question? <laughs> that's what I, I I knew I'd forget it. Yeah, that's the Skagit Queen there, which was also there as a restaurant during the World's Fair. And what happened to it? It sunk. It sunk. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I'd forgotten that it sunk, Where? but not for long. There it is, right there. Oh my God. <clears throat> This is from uh, 69. It was there a long time sunk. There's the Polynesian restaurant. Yeah. What's that? There's the Polynesian. How many of you have eaten in the Polynesian? Raise your hands. OK, let's, for competition's sake, how many have eaten in Ivers? Raise your hands. Well, more of you at Ivers. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right, go ahead. We got a race here. Oh, there you are, Peter. There's your windward. This is a detail that shows us the Pike Place uh, pier right there. So let's move on. Uh, we could get a core sample. Oh, remember the Bay Building? I mean, the Sea Family, not Bay, no, the Sea, sea Candies Company building right there. That's somewhere, the Windward's right, around, right underneath here somewhere. Go ahead. That's a parking lot now. There it is again. There's the Pike Street Coal Wharf. There's the Pike Street Incline, the first of the Pike Street Hill Climbs right there. Magnolia in the distance, the Mitchell Shipyards right here. And this is out the back window of the Peterson Brothers studio at the foot of Cherry Street. Go ahead. Uh, there is, again, out uh, there at the same place, they're building the Georgie Star there. Yes, there's Wharf. There's the St Georgie Star years later, one of the mainstays of the waterfront. And that's all the shipping you're getting tonight. <laughs> so we're just doing, uh, go ahead. Uh, and there we see in, in 77, the bunkers caved in. And the interesting thing about that is we're fortuitous. Uh, the worms again got them. Uh, just before these caved in, there, uh, a, a, cable, a car, a coal car came unhinged on the incline, and all the workers that were out of the bunker were over there fixing it. So they all, you know, they were all saved by the, ac the one accident from the other accident. Go ahead. Oh, this is from 82, and we can see here the ravages of that Pike Place Pier. Remember, the King Street Pier took its place with a more direct route around the south end of Lake Washington to get to the coal fields, because this route went through Lake Union and Montlake Cut and across the lake. It was tortuous. But here we are looking along that bank of the north end of the central waterfront. So Pike Street, here's where that cliff starts, right from Virginia Street and maintains itself until it gets to right here, and that, that right there is the same as right here. And that, believe it or not, is a ravine that goes back all the way to First Street, Belltown Ravine, which is all filled now, going out to this pier at Broad Street. Go ahead. Okay, now this is the uh, story of the ram's horn. Remember we saw the ram's horn, that curving track? We were looking during the fire from here, down at it, here it is. Now. See this structure right here? That was a furniture factory at the foot of Pike Street or near it, and later a salmon cannery. Now, when the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern built along the waterfront, and this is sort of a testimony to the importance of north-south priority that is moving through this town, they cut this in two. Go ahead. And you can see right there. It's separated <laughs> so they could bring the railroad through it. So compare that and that. And there's the ram's horn right there next to the Seattle Lakeshore. <coughs> And remember, that's where the fire was stopped <coughs> along the waterfront because of a bucket brigade. 
and they just lined up there and wouldn't let the fire go up these trestles any further. This is from 87, about two years before the fire. Go ahead. And there's again is that spot right there. Now, the Schwabecker's Wharf was right in here. Go ahead. And it became, it was right in here. Oh, and there's that building that took the place of the weed home that we took. See, there's the, the home of the, uh, of the Denny's right there. But go ahead. The Schwabecker's Wharf right here was really the only substantial wharf that didn't, the, the fire didn't get to. So most of the rebuilding of the city for the first month went across that wharf and then went up that wagon road on Union Street to get to the city for reconstruction. Go ahead. Oh, and this is Schwabacher later on. And this is also instructive because it shows us how the, in the early uh, 20th century, Railroad Avenue got, went through its last extension. This view is first, an old shed. And if you, uh, these pictures are taken from the same place. You can figure that out by how these pipes line up right here against these buildings and these buildings against these. It's the same place. Now you notice that this shed right here is forward and to the left of this shed. Well, it's actually just forward. This has been moved back. So the front of this is about here, okay? And then the Railroad Avenue has been widened out in order to give that stretch for moving wagons and, and automobiles and, and trucks up and down right next to the piers. Go ahead. Uh, these were the old sheds that were there during the 90s. They didn't, they didn't last long. Uh, they were changed in the early part of the 20th century. You're looking down over from those hotels between University and Seneca. Go ahead. In fact, this shed right here reappears right here. Looking down the trestle that came on University Street from First all the way to Railroad Avenue over both Post and Western. And these ships are headed for the Philippines to... Uh, the insurrection there, you know, the natives are insurrecting in the Philippines at that time. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, yes? That's a, that's a, uh, it's actually snug, and it's a saloon. And there's a good story with that saloon, but we don't have time to tell it. <laughs> Go ahead. I think it's in one of my books, so I don't, I don't want to push it, but. <laughs> uh, look at here, back up, would you, Steph? Stephanie, uh, don't, don't know her well enough to call her Steph yet, actually. Uh, he, you see, this is the short railroad avenue. They haven't pushed it out that extra, oh, 20 yards or so. And so it is, if it looks shorter here, go ahead, than it is here in about 1908. That's because it is, this is probably all new right here, although it's really beat up by this time. There's the Snug Harbor soon again, and that, yeah, go ahead. And uh, there's 1903 when they're welcoming Roosevelt uh, to the town, Theodore Roosevelt. And there's the Arlington Hotel again. And remember, that was the foundation of this building that stopped the fire, that is, it moved up along the waterfront. Go ahead. So you had two things that stopped it, the foundation of the hotel and the bucket brigade on the trestles. Uh, here they are building the, the, the piers you know and love from you know, 44 through 47. This is 45, 54, 55 rather. And here they are building uh, the Galbraith Dock, which becomes yes, uh, Ivers. And there's that old coal trestle that we, I told you about several times earlier from the 90s. Can I tell? Is this is, no, this is 1901 probably, or even 1900. I think this is 1900. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, there they are, all lined up, uh, looking from where the steam plant is uh, near Columbia Street. And they've still got this muddle of structures between Coleman Dock, which itself is a bit of a muddle. But there's Ivers, and, and you know, that's, that's the, the piers that you know that are still there. Go ahead. But, the, the, but it hasn't been widened yet. But you see these, oh, very good instruction. Oh, very, very good instruction. Look, see how these piers are built back compared to these? Because they're going to widen the, Widen Railroad Avenue when they built these. This is the old line, and then this is the new line, post 20th century line. Go ahead. Ah, well, one of them fell in uh, very soon after it was built. If you want to back up, uh, it was this one right here, only this is the renewed one that, that was built. The first one they put in there fell in. Go ahead. Nobody, nobody was uh, killed, although a couple of people scampered and got off in time. Go ahead. Uh, there's the Coleman Dock quite early. 
before the fire. You remember the uh, Bud Longs in the Opera House? We've seen something similar to this earlier. Go ahead. Uh, here is Coleman Doc. Uh, because you like catastrophes, we're going to end now with a few catastrophes. Uh, th these are the events that I brought you. And this one is the, the crash of the Alameda into the Coleman Dock in 1912. This is the Coleman Dock in 1911 for the, uh, for the uh, Golden Potlatch. Now, you mentioned, one of you mentioned the, uh, I, think, I think it was Jan, but it was uh, about uh, a celebration before, Fleet, before Fleet Seafair. Week. Fleet, week. Fleet, Fleet week. week, yeah. Well, before that, they had Golden Potlatch. And uh, Golden Potlatch is right here. It was a week long. Now imagine you're on the Alameda and you're heading the dock in this place. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a big ocean-going vessel. And your name is Captain Dynamite John O'Brien. And you instruct the man at the lever in the bottom of the ship, full steam astern. And he misreads you and goes full steam ahead. <laughs> <laughs> With this effect. Go ahead. <laughs> Again, no lives were lost. It was late at night. A couple of people did jump into the bay, but they got out. A few pigeons did die from this. But, uh, and now for another catastrophe. Go ahead. Next door. Oh, there's the, the, they found that the next morning. Go ahead. That clock has still survives. I think it's in a, it's in a case down there. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, next picture is uh, of the Grand Trunk Dock, which was completed in... Uh, 1910, I think uh, October 30th, 1910. It was the largest wooden wharf on the waterfront. It was spectacular, 106 foot tall tower. Hard, hard wood finishing on the inside. 625 foot uh, long pier. Again, it was the largest wooden pier in the, in the United States, in the States at that time. And it only lasted four years. Be What's that? That's the Smith Tower being built, yeah. 1913, this would be. See, here's the new Coleman Dock Tower that replaced the old one. Remember, we saw this being built a long time ago? All right. Here, here's, the, here's that beautiful structure, which catches fire in May. Go ahead. In this hand-colored version of its destruction. <coughs> and here's the completed, but not yet open. This opens July 4th, 1914, so a couple of months after this fire. Go ahead. That was the Duwamish, I think, probably, yeah. Go ahead. Now, let's look down from uh, Smith Tower, and we're going to look down here in 61, okay? Just before the World's Fair, uh, we see the Grand Truck that replaced it right there. Ivers is right there. Look at the stubby little 55, which is still fairly stubby. And here's Coleman Dock, but it doesn't have any waiting area for cars except this little area right here. And soon after this, it would take, tear this down and turn it into a waiting period. And then a few years later, they would tear both of these down, right? And make this a waiting period. But you recognize this. And uh, let's go ahead and look at the next shot. So this is 61. And here we are in 65, where they're tearing down that Grand Trunk dock, the one that replaced the one that burned down. And there's the fire station. Go ahead. Uh, back up. <clears throat> He went two back, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that is the Bologna. Yeah. Go ahead. Ah, the fire station. Ivor had a long romance between the fire station and his acres of clams, and Fitzgerald, the fire chief, and the different... Oh, he, was, he always wanted to paint it. And finally, they let him do it just before the World's Fair, this firehouse red. <laughs> and uh, that was just shortly before it was torn down. This is 63. Look at that car. I think that's been posed there, actually. <laughs> Go ahead. There's been about five different stations there. And here is Ivor back in the 40s. Uh, focus. Can we get a focus on that? Just somebody go and focus it. Anybody that's near the thing, there's probably a focus knob on it. <laughs> Automatic. Yep. Oh, one of the things I ever wanted to do was paint the fire stack of the, the Duwamish, which here he finally got to be done. But he couldn't supply his own paint. The city had to pay for it. <laughs> now, did I put on, you know, I put on, did I put on, oh, I forgot. I was going to put on my Ivor hat at the beginning, and I forgot here, because I was going to make an award of somebody in the audience who could 
who could, uh, there was, there was going to be a prize award, and we're going we're to award the prize right now. And remember, we're doing all this because I, I gave you the origins of my interest in the waterfront. It's really especially involved in the, the fact that I did that work in the, in the restaurant. Now, who can name, and that's the first name, and you have to be honest about this, and you'll have to help me, your neighbors. I want you, the person who can first give me the last name of the person who is at the middle of this picture. Oh, who said wing? Who said wing? You win. That, that, well, you, that's, that's good enough. That's Wing Luke, city councilman, right. First, first uh, Asian-American councilman on the waterfront, I mean on the city council. And this is the dedication of the new fire, of the new firehouse. There, there he is right there. <laughs> you know, he died in a plane crash with Annie Gerber's husband uh, sometime not long after this, I think maybe 65 or something. And he was a marvelous guy. Um, you can find him on History Link. You want to read about him? Go to History Link and you, you can read about him. Um, anyway, so there's Wing. And there's Ivor singing a song he wrote for the dedication. There's Clinton. There's Fire Chief Fitzgerald. There's the Firehouse Five. And there earlier is Ivor g signing V for victory for getting the OK to paint the fire stack red. Go ahead. Oh, wait. You get that map. Who, who, let's see, stand up. Let's have the, uh, stand up, the winner of the prize. Please, stand up. Stand up. Wait. Who was it that said Wing Luke? Stand up. That's an order. Is that, that's Howard, isn't it? No, you did. Well, how did you get, who did? Didn't you say Wing Luke? Somebody said it. Who said it? Oh, hey, let's give this a... And you were going to let Howard take your hat? <laughs> What's your name? You really get a hat. I brought it. I convinced them. Here it is. Here's your hat. Well, I'm going to pass it up to you now, okay? And those... Uh, I don't know if I can get it that far. No, I can't. Thank you. Okay. Um... All right, well, let's keep going. We, we don't have got much farther to go here. Uh, oh, here they are in 1903, starting to wear the cliff away to, to make the entrance to the tunnel that goes under the city. Go ahead. And here they are actually pretty, pretty well along. You can see bringing the dirt out, some of which they dumped on the waterfront. This building, which is at the corner of First and Pike, would have to go because the tunnel was undermining it. It was the York Hotel. Go ahead. <coughs> And here we are standing on that overpass, that, that trestle I was talking about at Pike Street, looking about World War I time at the servicemen here. So it's really being quite used. This area right here is now pedestrian. And this is when Pike Street Wharf was really all about fishing. All the fishing organizations were there, plus some fish cannery even, and a lot of cannery behind us too. Go ahead. Now this... Oh, and in 25, Mayor Brown proposed to create this structure, bridging Railroad Avenue and hooking up with the Pike Place Wharf right there. Of course, it didn't happen. Would have destroyed, there's Pike Place right there. Go ahead. And look at this. Now, that same place from the same trestle, this big wound is open up in Railroad Avenue, and we can see the, the, the fill underneath it. And, and there's no seawall here yet, so the tides and high tides could be hitting right against this. And this is right before they're going to start building the seawall from Madison to Broad Street. Go ahead. And there they're building the seawall. There's the Schwabackers, the Pike Street. What year was that? This is 34 or 35. The, the project was between 34 and 36. <clears throat> Go ahead. And there at Wall Street, you can see the big gaps in the waterfront and the tides coming in. This is about 1910. And look at this. There's the old parallel pier along the waterfront of the foot of Lenora Street. That's why after World War II, the Port of Seattle said, didn't know what they were going to do, but they said, well, I think we're going to build, we think we're going to build big parallel piers that, can, that they can park the big boats against, because certainly we can't put piers that are long out into the water, because the bay's too deep. So the very reason that Denny and Bell and Boren liked the bay, because it was deep, so they could build their short little wharf and have a ship come up, was bad for big ships because 
basically the bay was too deep to handle big ships. They wanted distances or drafts that were just the right depth, and that was at the tidelands where they could dredge it. Hence, you've got all of the big shipping happening down south. And plus, you've got much more room there to warehouse stuff and put containers. Yes? Indian canoe. Yeah, Indian canoe, right. Go ahead. Uh, there was a big fire down there at Wall Street. It didn't really affect the wharfs much. It was in 1910, but it swept through about four city blocks. Go ahead. There you see the actual work of, here is before. This is from the Bell Street overpass. Before, during, and after. 34, 36. And here's what it was like underneath. Go ahead. Ah, the Port of Seattle. Um, very important player on the waterfront ever since it was organized in, well, it started building in 1914, but the act was 1911. And it bought lots of property, even when it didn't have much money, it sensibly brought a lot of property. Um, it really was, in part, organized because of the mess that was on Railroad Avenue, and everybody understood that something had to be done about that. Go ahead but we're not gonna deal with the port much. But on the waterfront there, going back into the 80s, there's that trestle, Seattle Lakeshore, and Eastern Broad Street down here. Uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of the ravine at, at, uh, because we, we were showing the natural land. So there's your natural land below, beneath Lenora Street. Go ahead. <clears throat> and there's the ravine. You can't really see it, it's right here, but you can see the south bank going into it. This is early 20th century in this community of squatters right here. And they were there quite a while, through most of the 90s and into the, into the 20th century, until they brought the railroad through here to the tunnel in 1903. So these were eliminated in 1903. Go ahead. That's, that's, bat, that's between Blanchard and Bell. This turn right here is on Bell Street. So that would be Water or, or, or Elliott turning on to Bell right there. And this ravine was between Bell and Blanchard a little bit closer to Bell, and it went all the way into First Avenue. And there's slides that show that, we just don't have time to show them. Go ahead, please answer your phone. <laughs> okay, uh, and then we go down to Broad Street, and there's uh, a late 1890s shot. I remember when Ballast Island was covered over in the late 1890s, the natives, when they were he heading for hop fields or whatever, would now park off and right here at, at uh, near Broad Street, or they would go down on the Tide Flats south of King Street, okay? I think it's about, oh, there. Gordon There's Gordon Benson in 82 when he, when he started the, uh, the line on Christmas of 82, posing with his uh, trolley cars. <laughs> Go ahead. And Santa. Now, this is the next to the last, uh, next to the last slide, and I, I, I put this in here as, as sort of vainly as my contribution to the Olympic Sculpture Garden. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking through this neighborhood uh, about a quarter century ago and saw this split sign laying against an old wall to one of their old Union 76 company buildings and took this picture and really like it a lot. And I think at least conceptually it should be part of the new, uh, you know, because it really is the first piece of, uh, documented piece of uh, found sculpture on the site of the future Olympic Sculptures Garden. Do you all agree with that? Yeah, thank you. Well, write your letters. Now, no, 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 I don't agree with that. If you if you've thought that anything that I said intimated I was down with it, I'm not. I love the idea of it. So there. <laughs> Call me a uh, something. I'm not sure what I'd be called anymore. Now, the next slide is the last slide. Go ahead. And I want to briefly explain something about it. And that is, these are one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six examples of different plans for the waterfront. And the earliest one is right here, I believe. This was Reginald Thompson's plan, 1909, for extending the waterfront out to two blocks. This is 1913, right in the central waterfront. Uh, this is about 56, it had a big, big development offshore. This is uh, in the 60s, world's, right after the World's Fair. Here's that longitudinal pier suggestion after the wor Second World War, you know, which we were talking about. 
So one of the things to do in the, in the report I'm doing is I'm going to study these things and the rock rise, there are other reports, the rock rise reports from the 60s, uh, which they suggested getting rid. They, he made four suggestions and three of those involved getting rid of the Alaska Wave Viaduct. Uh, I'm going to look through all those reports and try to com do a comparative study of them because I think, you know, the reports are made and then, you know, they're enjoyed for the moment and then they're not used and they could be. So I'm going to make a comparative study of them. Uh, now, if we turn the house lights on, if you have any questions. Yes,